All right, we're going to begin our time together this morning at 9.30. But until then, let's read through some Psalms together. This morning, we're going to read through Psalm 23, 24, 29. And if we get time, Psalm 91. As elders, we sat down and discussed who would be best to read the Psalms before the service this morning. Who had the most melodious voice? And they chose Z, but alas, he was better technically than all of us put together. So I will read the Psalms for us this morning. Let's begin in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Psalm 24 reads, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of armies. He is the King of glory. Of glory. Psalm 29 reads Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord above the vast water, the voice of the Lord is power. The voice of the Lord is splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the woodlands bare. In his temple, all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned, king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Now, I don't think we're going to get time to read Psalm 91 this morning, but I'll finish off with Psalm 1 together. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway for sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowering streams, that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. We'll begin our time at 9.30. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual gathering of Grace Bible Church 
Holland Park. I'm here in the sanctuary with the elders and a small handful of people who are helping to stream this service to you this morning. And I can tell you, we miss you. We miss seeing your faces. We miss hearing your voices and we miss your sweet fellowship this morning. But the church is not a building for God who made the world and everything in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. We are members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, we are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. And so although we are separated by distance this morning, we are united through Christ, who, has our, who is our salvation, our strength, and our joy. As we begin this morning, the elders would like to thank you for your understanding and your patient, patience during this time. Thank you especially for praying for us as we wrestle with many difficult decisions at the moment. And thank you for those who have kindly expressed their love and support through emails and through phone calls this last week. We know that people hold different views in relation to gathering in person or online, and so we appreciate your understanding in the decision we have made to meet in this way this morning. We also ask you to particularly maintain fellowship with each other through phone calls, text messages, emails, social media, and above all, be praying for each other and be praying for our government as they lead us through this time of challenge and uncertainty. Well, let's do that right now. Danny's here and he's going to come and lead us in prayer. Well, let's begin our time in prayer together this morning. Dearest Heavenly Father, as we begin our time together this morning in these unusual times, we pray for your blessing and that your presence would be with all of us scattered around Brisbane, that you would give us a special sense of unity, unity in you and love, love for one another, even though we cannot be with each other this morning. Lord, we thank you for the gift of technology that that, even al that allows us even now to gather together. And Lord, we miss each other and we miss the, the way it feels to be gathered as one, to be encouraging each other in person. But Lord, even now, may you be our comfort and our guide. May we look to you for security and encouragement. May we be eager to reach out to each other in love and in service. Lord, I pray for hearts and minds that seek to honour and glorify you this morning. Lord, thank you that you are sovereign. Cause us to remember this morning that you are the creator of all things, sustainer of all things. Our time is in your hands. Our every breath is a gift of your power and grace. Lord, I pray that in the midst of uncertainty, we would stand this morning on the rock of ages, who was unshakable and unmovable, who has existed forever and will exist forevermore. Lord, help us to be faithful as we go about our lives in relative exclusion. Give us opportunity to share your gospel where we may. Give us the words when we do that. Lord, we pray for the government, for discernment and wisdom. Lord, we pray for the people, that they would submit to the authority of this government, that they would do what is socially responsible out of love for their neighbour. Lord, I pray particularly this morning for our church, for its elders and deacons and members and those who meet regularly here. Lord, give us opportunity to serve one another and to love one another. Lord, I pray for those among us who, who are acutely feeling the isolation. May they look to you and find comfort in you. Lord, I pray for the sick as well. Lord, cause them to trust in a time when there will be no sickness and no death. Lord, I pray that we would turn our eyes on you so that we may not become easily anxious about the times. Help us to 
trust in the one who is in control. Lord, I also pray for those who are struggling with loss of income. Lord, provide for them. Lord, even find them more work. Lord, comfort them and their families. Lord, as we continue on in our time together this morning, again, give us a special sense of your blessing. All these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, you know that one of my favorite parts of gathering together is singing. For things, few things in this life blessed me more than hearing my church family join together to lift their voices in praise to the Lord. I will miss that this morning. And unfortunately for you, apart from the few voices you will hear in your living room, the only voice you will hear will be mine. So get ready to turn the volume way down on your TVs and computers and be sure that you sing up really loudly this morning. But be assured, no matter where we all are, as we lift our voices together, God will hear them And he will be pleased with the sweet aroma of worship we offer in the name of our Lord Jesus. So with that in mind, may we rejoice and praise the one who is forever faithful. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. The words will appear on your screen as we sing. So sing up and let's uh, praise the Lord together.
Roy's here too this morning. He's going to tell us about some of the things that we will be doing to maintain fellowship in this time when we are unable to meet in person. Come up, Roy. Thanks. Don't mind me, Moz. <laughs> Good morning, church. Um, I'm sure many of you are dressed in your Sunday best sitting on the couch uh, this morning. Andrew Hughes isn't here. Um, anyway. Look, these are interesting times. Uh, these are insightful times and they are definitely turbulent times uh, for many. Uh, and because uh, they're interesting times, we do recognize that uh, many of uh, the members at Grace will be feeling uh, the weight of isolation, of uh, loneliness, um, and things of that nature. And so we recognize that being uh, stuck at home uh, and not being here is not the ideal. Um, we certainly didn't imagine 2020 to be uh, sort of kicking off like this, but uh, we do serve a sovereign God. And so uh, I was tasked this morning with giving a communication update on what the elders at Grace are planning on doing, hoping on doing over the next uh, coming weeks with online services and ways that we can facilitate uh, virtual fellowship, if we'll call it that. And so the first thing we're looking to do is, is planning on involving uh, the members at Grace into our Sunday services uh, as we stream on a Sunday morning. And so the first way we're going to plan on doing that is to continue on with uh, the rotations that we were doing. So these are things like uh, testimonies, prayers, looking at a section of a, a particular creed or confession, things like that are still planning on um, happening. So we are planning on calling in various members on a Sunday morning to uh, still give a testimony. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll come in here in the church on a Sunday. They can pre-record and we can stream that on our video on a Sunday morning as well. So we are planning on remaining on doing rotations. Secondly, and very exciting, um, we do plan on potentially incorporating a children's talk or a Sunday school segment um, prior to the service starting on a Sunday. So things like Bible stories, interactive skits, arts and crafts are just some of the things that uh, the kids at Grace Bible Church will still be able to learn and grow in their knowledge of, of Christ and the scriptures. Um, and then they can sit through the service at 9.30 with their parents in their living room while still working on their arts and crafts uh, and things like that. Uh, thirdly, we are looking at some social media platforms where you guys can su submit photos or, or videos of uh, your family on a Sunday morning uh, in your lounge room worshipping together. Um, and th this is just simply to facilitate uh, a bit of camaraderie and fellowship and fun um, and, and just to stay connected in these um, turbulent times. Fourth, I'm sure many of you have uh, received Sana's email about the Elvento prayer chain. So prayer is still going to be a vital part of Grace uh, community. And so we, we, um, we do ask that you would uh, get onto Elvento, leave a, a short prayer request in the coming weeks so that members and, and regular attenders can still uh, pray for you and your requests, as I'm sure many will be coming in in the next coming weeks. And as always, if, if it's a prayer request that is of a private nature, just email one of the elders uh, or email the church email uh, in that. Fifth, we do encourage um, all of you to join at least one of our online fellowship groups, whether that's a grace group, authentic manhood, uh, um, home group, whatever it is, we strongly encourage each member to stay connected uh, especially when they're going to be feeling very isolated uh, and things like that. So please join one of our uh, fellowship groups. Um, and if you want to join a group or you're not sure um, how to get in contact with a group, um, please email Richard, Richard Watson, uh, at richard at gracebible.org.au. Um, and his email will be on the um, church website just under the, the live stream video you're currently watching his email and Sana's email should be there as well so email Richard to join uh, one of those groups um, and remember this this is all very new for us um, th the first few weeks are going to be a bit edgy and, and, and not so good so we do ask for your patience uh, with this uh, and the last thing I'll say and then I'll get off 
Uh, if you haven't been contacted by the end of the week by uh, one of our elders um, or pastors, then it means that we don't have your details. It means that you've either slipped through the cracks or um, we don't have your, your email at all. And so uh, we need to keep in contact with you as shepherds. We, we need to uh, show oversight and care for you. And so uh, we ask that you would email Sana if, um, if we haven't contacted you by the end of the week, just to double check that you are in our system. So email Sana at sana at gracebible.org.au. And again, her email's uh, just under the video on the website. Uh, Our heart is that we would all remain connected and in touch with the church community in this time. And so let's rejoice and let's trust in our sovereign God together. Well, as the world struggles with uncertainty during this time, we look to God, the creator of heaven and earth. And so no matter what the challenges we face, and I don't minimize the hardships some in our church family are already suffering, but as we look to God, our souls can sing, what blessed assurance I found in you. I won't be shaken. I will not be moved. How steadfast your strong hand is keeping me, is keeping me. I won't be shaken. I will not be moved. So let's sing again. Let's sing this great song and be reminded of these truths. Attempts to be satisfied with the pain and empty until the moment you rescued me and your love filled me. My soul sings now, my soul sings. What blessed assurance. that I've 
Well, as we were driving to the council polling booth for early voting the other day, we were struggling to see the right street when Edward piped up from the back seat and said, we should have brought the Bible. He repeated it again, adding, because the Bible is the map. The world is searching for directions and for answers during this health crisis. God has given us the answers and the direction in his map, the Bible. Dean is here with us this morning. She's going to read from God's word, and then Craig will preach from this passage. Good morning, church. Let's read Isaiah 40, 21 to 31 together. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. To whom will you compare me or who is my equal? Asks the Holy One. Look up and see. Who created these? He brings out the stars by number. He calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Jacob, why do you say? And Israel, why do you assert? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my claim is ignored by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, wherever you are. I had to tell you, just one week ago, this Sunday service was looking very different. We had six baptisms planned, and I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to those baptisms, especially because four of the ones who were going to be baptized have been in this church since the day they were born. We've watched them grow up, and one of them's dating someone who's been in the church since the day they were born. Z was scheduled to start a new mini-series I was supposed to be out the back doing parenting, teaching on being a dad. And then suddenly we're tossed into this maelstrom of decisions. It's hard to describe what this week's been like. Uh, Do we cancel services? Do we not? What do we do about fellowship groups? Uh, Questions about how do we shepherd our flock in these difficult times? Write down a very practical things. Anybody got any idea how to stream, looking around? Thank you to Z and thank you to others who have some idea. Uh, Even things like, do we have music or not, since really we only have one elder who can hold a tune. Um, How do we do communion? Still working on that. Frankly, there's a lot of things we're still working out. I didn't even get to sit down and start thinking through, what do I want to say to you until we got through all our technology tests and we were pretty sure this was going to work yesterday? Related to that, thank you to a small army who've worked tirelessly from home and then here to enable this service to happen at very short notice. Uh, Perhaps one good thing about this pandemic is uh, someone said it's going to drag some of us into the online world a little more. Uh, I've learned more about online video, online conferencing, social media in the last week than I think I have in the rest of my life. So as Roy's already commented, We are working on ways to connect you, to shepherd you, encourage you, support you. Uh, First and foremost, that's going to be online, but we're also working through other ways. So please, please, as Roy said, 
Uh, if you're not getting emails from us, if nobody's in contact with you, it means we've either got your details wrong or you're not on our database. If you aren't getting the emails, let Sana know. If you're not being connected on our Facebook page or one of our online groups, let Richard know. And if you haven't been one of, a part of one of our groups before, this is a great time to get involved in one of the online groups that we're in the process of setting up. And as well, I would encourage all of you, just pick up the phone and call someone, text someone, uh, video chat someone, reach out to others in the church, and as well, remember your neighbours, uh, the people around you. These are unprecedented times. I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's so surreal to be standing up here and looking around at empty seats. I already miss every one of you. But as I stand here, one thing I do want you to know is that every elder, every pastor, every leader here at Holland Park, our hearts are with you, and we're thankful that you are joining with us to worship this morning. So I don't want any of you to feel alone as you go through this, and in the days ahead, we're going to work at ways to make sure that we're all connected. We know these are going to be tough times. We know some of you are going to hurt physically, some financially, some emotionally. We're already working out ways that we can minister to you and we encourage you to minister to one another. Look out for communications in the weeks ahead about how you can help in this. But today the elders decided it would be appropriate this week and then next week just to pause what we're doing and just to talk about comfort in turbulent times. So before we look at that passage, why don't you just join with me and pray. Our Father, you sit enthroned in heaven. You are sovereign over the course of every atom within your universe. And we know that these events, like every other trial this world has faced, are completely under your control. And you have promised to be our protector our dwelling place, our rock, our ever-present help in times of need. And we know that in Christ you are working all things together for good. Help each of us to rest in those promises this day and in the days ahead. We need not fear for to us to live as Christ and to die as gain. Help us to live faithfully as salt and light in these difficult days. Help us to be a good testimony to a watching world. And as we turn to your word, I ask that this morning it would guide us, strengthen us, comfort us. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. On Thursday this week, my news feed flashed up that President Trump had called a press conference and he was doing it jointly with the Food and Drug Administration of the United States. And comments started flowing. This is it. They've found the cure. We're saved. And people got excited. Financial markets got interested. And then the reality, he announced that some older anti-malarial drugs were showing potential in treating COVID-19. And you could feel worldwide disappointment. People are aching for a cure. They want a drug they want a vaccine. They want some technology that's going to make this nightmare that we are entering end. And if not, they at least want an end date. Well, this morning, and I trust it's an encouragement to you, my message is about as simple as it gets. In a very real sense, we do have the cure. And it's that our God is greater. Our God is greater than anything you face, I face, our world faces today. See, as Christians, we know why there is a pandemic loose on our streets. It's a fallen world, and sin changed everything. Because of sin, disease and illness and war and famine and drought and ultimately death are the inevitable and universal consequences of living in a fallen world. Now, sometimes it's easy to forget that. We live in a very blessed country where we have been relatively untouched by what many in our world and throughout history have faced. Pam famine, poverty, uncertainty and disease are the daily staple of life for many, including many Christians in our world. And even in the most affluent countries, 
with the most advanced medical care available, there are untreatable diseases, old age is relentless, and death is a certainty. What the COVID-19 crisis has done is to demonstrate with devastating clarity the truth that life is uncertain and death is inevitable. We live in a fallen, broken world. There are consequences of sin. They affect us every day. They affect us at greater times at various times throughout history. And ultimately, every one of us will be touched by it. But I remind you as Christians, we do have the cure for what ails the world. The ills of the world before COVID-19, the ills of the world after COVID-19, and the ills of the world right in the midst of the whirlwind of COVID-19. So here's the truth I want to comfort you with this morning. When the storm is raging, remember that while our problems are great, our God is greater. When the storm is raging, remember that while our problems are great, our God is greater. Brothers and sisters, our problems are indeed great. Sin means that we live in a fallen world and the problems a fallen world do face are great. In fact, humanly, they're insurmountable. We can't stop them, we can't eradicate them. This is rooted in what happened at the fall. In Genesis 3, 17 to 19, God said to Adam, because you ate from the tree, the ground's cursed because of you, you'll return to the ground since you were taken from it, for you are dust and you will return to dust. The ground's cursed because of you. The earth is cursed. The universe is cursed. Everything in it is cursed. There will be thorns and thistles instead of fruit and plenty. The work that you once did as a privilege now becomes a necessity. Famine, loss, disease will become a natural and inevitable part of life. Viruses and bacteria will now cause illness and pandemics. And finally, the Lord said, instead of getting to eat from the tree of life and living, men and women will ultimately return to the dust. They will die. So the unpalatable, unpalatable truth is that we live in a world where there are earthquakes, tsunamis, famine, war, pandemics, and death. All entered the moment Adam ate. And it wasn't just Adam. We've walked in the steps of Adam. By the days of Noah, here was the world. Genesis 6, 5 and 6. When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and he was deeply grieved. That led to the first great natural disaster, the flood, but the flood has not been the last great disaster. The Bible itself recounts many tragedies, famines, pestilence, wars, genocides. History is filled with problems, including terrible pandemics. A pandemic is not something the world is facing for the first time. It has faced many throughout history. They've occurred regularly. Two of the worst pandemics were the Black Death devastated the world from 1347 to 1351. It's estimated that 75 to 200 million people died. That was 30 to 60% of the population. The Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920, affected 500 million people, a quarter of the Earth's population, and killed 20 to 50 million people. Now, even the direst predictions of the pandemic of today are saying we will not have that kind of effect. But while it may not be black death, let's be realistic. COVID-19 is already having a major effect and it's going to have a major effect on our lives. People in our church will catch COVID-19. People in our church community will lose their jobs. Some watching this will face serious financial hardship. And tragically, if we believe the trajectory, everyone is going to know somebody somewhere touched by death. And I pray that we as a fellowship will escape unscathed, but it is certainly possible that our church may have to face that eventuality. Our problems are great. We need to be realistic. We've all watched the heart-wrenching scenes in Wuhan, in northern Italy, in Madrid. And so 
It is not true to just say something like, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We're about to enter a time where the world and life as we know it will change and people will be hurting. The question I want to address for us as a people of faith is, how do we respond? Let me put it this way. It was only on December 31 last year that China alerted the WHO to several unusual cases of pneumonia in Wuhan. Today, coronavirus is word of the year. It is most likely going to be word of the decade. It might possibly even be word of the century. But as this timeline suggests, as recently as Christmas, when we were sitting down, tucking into our Christmas dinner, no one in Australia had heard of novel coronavirus or COVID-19. But I remind you, that did not mean we were living in a perfect paradise, a world without problems. People were still getting ill and dying every day. From December 31 to today, at least two people from our church have had parents die. At least five have been hospitalised with serious illness. It is just that in this pandemic, the problems we face are greater in scope and intensity, and I know there is fear and I know there is anxiety. So yes, our problems are great. But this morning, I want to remind you to cling to one unshakable truth. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Over the last few weeks, some have asked me, what does that mean? Does it mean we just choose not to be anxious? I mean, Christians should not get concerned about what's happening and what's going on. Someone said, look, Jesus said, don't be anxious about your life. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. I would say it depends what you mean by not being anxious. If you read those verses in that context, it doesn't mean be oblivious to what's going on. It means you should be concerned about what's coming. Instead, these are exhortations to believers to have faith because Jesus went on to say this, therefore don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself Each day has enough trouble of its own. There are troubles in our world. Jesus is realistic. Each day has enough trouble without worrying about tomorrow. His point, if you read what's in between those, is that we have to have faith in a sovereign God who can feed, clothe, provide and protect. In the midst of trouble, he says, remember, we have an anchor, a shepherd, a protector. Our God is greater, and this is the antidote to fear and anxiety. When Jesus was facing the trial of the cross, he said, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. It's tough, but he said he would trust, and we are to trust. So this morning, I want to share some words of comfort in turbulent times from one of my favorite places in the Word. This is a place I go to so often. It's a place that screams, whatever issue you are facing, we are facing our God's greater. It's Isaiah 40. I remind you that this chapter is written to the Jews who are in despair. The nation of Babylon had come in and devastated their society devastated Judea, devastated Jerusalem. The few survivors have been carted off 900 miles in exile in Babylon. They'd been there for generations. They feared that God had abandoned them. They had no hope for the future. What do you say to a people who are worried about the future? What do you say to a people who are facing a testing time? You remind them that God is great and far from abandoning them, He's working together a plan to save them. So if you've got your Bibles there at home, open it up with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to go all the way back to verse 1. Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned. And she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. These have to be great words to hear. Comfort. Comfort. Here's what we find, though. The Jews in exile, they just wanted to return from the exile. 
That's all they wanted. But what we're going to find is God says, look, you need more than that. And so he offers a greater hope. He says, I'm going to deal with the root cause, not just of the exile, but of all sin, and not just the consequences of sin like the exile, but all consequences of sin forever. Today, many are just saying, I'm just waiting for the day I see vaccine discovered, cure discovered, herd immunity big enough, it's all over. But that's not going to end their real problem or our real problem. What will? Verses 3 to 5. A voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up, every mountain and hill will be leveled, the uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places are plain and the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. They're familiar words. This is how the Gospel of Mark opens. Jesus is coming. And then verses 9 to 11 tell us to climb a mountain, proclaim this good news. And then throughout the rest of Isaiah... We're going to find what the substance of that good news is, a suffering servant who will come to bear sin and take away the consequences of sin. But for the rest of Isaiah 40, Isaiah says, the message from God is, fear not, your God is greater. You know, in the past few weeks, I've been asked repeatedly, where's God in this pandemic? How can God allow this? To many, a God who allow a coronavirus to mutate and jump from animals to humans and then not intervene as it devastates the planet, either he's impotent or he's cruel. Many years back, Rabbi Harold Kushner's son died tragically and the rabbi struggled with this. And he ended up writing a very successful book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, and he reasoned that because his son did die, Either God was not powerful enough to stop it happening or that God just didn't care. Here was his conclusion. I can worship a God who hates suffering but cannot eliminate it more easily than I can worship a God who chooses to make children suffer and die. His God wanted to do something but couldn't. I want to tell you a God who can't help or won't help is not the God of Scripture. And I tell you, that kind of God does not bring much comfort in times like this. Isaiah scoffs at both options. In Isaiah 40, we are told, whatever's going on in your life, our awesome God, our great God, is able to deal with it. In verses 12 to 26, Isaiah says, this God, who is our God, is beyond compare. If you want something to hope in, here's the one you can place your hope in. Here's what he tells us. First, our God is beyond comparing to the greatest power, the greatest mind, the greatest nation, the greatest idol, the greatest ruler. He's utterly beyond compare. First, our God is beyond the greatest power. Look at verse 12. Who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, marked off the heavens with the span of his hand, who's gathered the dust of the earth in a measure, or weighed the mountains on a balance and the hills on the scales. Our world, or so we're told, contains 55,440 billion Olympic swimming pools of water. Who can get their mind around that? That's a lot of water. But Isaiah says nothing of God holds it in the palm of his hand. Our best guess is that the universe is 93 billion light years across. Again, a number, who can get their mind around that? Isaiah says it's the span of his hand. He measures it like that. The power of this God's beyond imagining. Or he says, if you could weigh everything, all the rocks, the dust, the mountains, supposedly it would weigh somewhere around 5,972 million billion billion kilograms. Again, you, you can't imagine that. But God can just gather it up. This is the God who says, fear not. Whatever you're going through, I'm with you. A God's beyond the greatest mind, verses 13 and 14. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Who gave him counsel? 
Who did he consult? Who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? People are asking us, why? People have asked me, how can the coronavirus possibly be part of the plan of God? How can he use this to work all things together for good? People have told me, if I were God, I'd be running this world very differently. And Isaiah says, really? Really? You want to tell God how to run the world? You want to challenge the plan and the wisdom of God? We can't grasp how all the threads fit together, but they do. I mean, which disciple, as they stood there at the foot of the cross and looked up, would have said, ah, this is not a tragedy, this is a triumph. I'm looking at the answer, the ultimate answer to all sin and death. The reality is you and I can't even get our mind around basic questions like creation, eternity, the universe. How could we ever fathom the plan of God that does involve deep things like suffering and death and this pandemic? But God who created everything from nothing, He knows this. More than that, it's not just that He knows the beginning from the end. Isaiah says He sovereignly works every event every good event, bad event, neutral event in the entire universe throughout all time, including this pandemic, together for good. Can I explain that? Can I put it together? No, I can't. But I know the one who can. Look, I have some clues of this. Perhaps this will provide opportunities for us to be salt and light and to show the love of God to a watching world. Perhaps the approach of death might shatter some complacent hearts and allow the gospel in. Perhaps God's doing this in part to shake the church, at least in the West, from its stupor. I do not know. I believe we're facing a -a once-in-a-generation opportunity where we are surrounded by people who are asking questions and we have answers. This is a chance as well to show the love of God in Christ to each other and to the world. What I do know is that God has all events under his control and within his plan. Now, as Christians, we should know this. We read the scriptures and we see it. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. Then there was a famine that came across the world and God used these events for good. Joseph rose to a position to save Israel to preserve the line of Messiah, and in fact, in this way, to save us. Now, if you and I were running the universe, I'm sure we would have said, we're rescuing Joseph, we're not allowing the famine, and we would have destroyed this plan. The cross, as I said, looked like a tragedy. It's a triumph, a divine triumph. Who has the wisdom to put this together? Not me, not you, only God. Do I understand this pandemic? No, I do not. Do I know the one who does? Yes, I do. As well, our God is beyond the greatest nation, 15 to 17. Look, the nations are like a drop in a a bucket. They're considered as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. Lebanon's setters are not enough for fuel or its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are considered by him as empty nothingness. Judah kept looking to the nations. We've got a problem, we'll go to the nations. We often do that as well. I ask you, where is your hope in this turbulent time? Is your hope that the government will push enough stimulus to save our economy? That the government will fund scientists that will cure the virus? that the government will look after us. Maybe they will, I trust they will, but maybe they can't. Isaiah says, there is one who will not fail. God who's created and sustained the heavens. There is no nation, no coalition of nations, no king, no empire who can compare with him. He gives an analogy. You're carrying a bucket of water and a single drop sloshes out. You don't even think about it. He says, 
compared to God, every nation that has ever existed or will exist is like that drop. Nothing. Our God, our God is the one in whom we trust. As well, he's greater than the greatest idol, verses 18 to 20. With whom will you compare God? What likeness will you set up for comparison with him? An idol? Something a smelter casts and a metal worker plates with gold and makes silver chains for. A poor person contributes wood for a pedestal that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not fall over. He says, don't look for help in other gods. The impotent gods of the world can't help us. Israel and Judah had repeatedly looked to the gods of the nations. They had long dalliances with idolatry. They could not help. Where do you look? Where do you put your trust? Is it just a trust in a doctor? Your bank balance? Some internet theorists? Look to God. He's greater than the greatest ruler, 21 to 24. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He reduces princes to nothing and makes the judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. Isaiah pictures the creator God looking down on the curve of the world, looking at all creation, not just observing, but directing everything that occurs in the world. He causes kings to rise. He blows on them and they're gone. So he raised up Pharaoh, he raised up Alexander, he raised up Caesar, he raised up ScoMo. I have watched as governments and world banks and the WHO scramble to contain the virus, and maybe they will and maybe they won't, but it shows me we are but men. The one we look to and trust is God. Isaiah finishes this section by saying, when you think about God, what do you think? Do you think, my God is utterly beyond compare? Look at verses 25 and 26. To whom will you compare me Or who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look up and see who created these. He brings out the stars by number. He calls them by name because of his great power and strength. Not one of them is missing. A.W. Tozer once said something very profound. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. That is so true. What in the depths of your heart do you think of God? Have you wondered, what's God doing? Is he in control of this situation? Or do you sleep well at night knowing, my God's got this. My God is greater. This is under his control. If we have the right view of God, even pandemics make sense. If we have the wrong view of God, then this fallen world leaves us with more questions than answers. Too often, we think we know how God should run this world. And if his plans, uh, if the way he's running it isn't matching up with our plans, we try and bring God down. We make him small. God, you should do this. God, you're making a mistake here. God, the world should be run differently. Isaiah says that will never do. That is a wrong view of God. He is beyond compare. He's not like anyone or anything. But there's another question that keeps coming up. Okay. How come bad stuff is happening? Doesn't God care? If he could do something, why isn't he? There are people getting sick and there are people dying. There are nations suffering. There are people losing their jobs, their homes, their futures, and it hurts. Doesn't God care? 
Well, in verses 27 to 31, Isaiah says, Oh yeah, God cares. Wow, does he care. See, God's not only great enough to do something, he has done something. Isaiah's gone and he said, Look, don't put your hope in kings, idols, scientists, armies, doctors. They may alleviate some of the uh, symptoms, some of the problems. But even if they do, they don't get to the real problem. Only one can do that. Even if they can do that, even if the virus goes, even if they save the economy, even if some normalcy returns to life, they haven't dealt with the real issue. Events like this remind us that no one, no government, no doctor, no leader, can deal with the root issue because it's all going to happen again. The only one who can deal with it is Jesus. He deals with sin. See, all Judah wanted was to be free from captivity. All people want today is an end to this virus mania. And God says, whoa, what this is meant to show you is that you need more. You see, even if there is an announcement, there is a cure, a vaccine, an end, it's only an end until the next pandemic, until the next war, until the next tsunami, until the next car crash. And ultimately, we all get old and death wins. And Isaiah says, what I want to remind you is that God has done something that will deal with all of this once and for all. If any are watching this and wonder what is the real answer to the pandemic, it's this. God so loved the world, he sent his beloved son to die, to cure sin, and cure all the consequences of sin, including pandemics. The cure is here then why is there a pandemic? If Jesus paid for sin. Well, he has not removed all sin from this world yet, because that would mean removing sinful men and women, and he is allowing us a time where we can repent, where we can choose to turn to him. And so in this time between times, between the cross and his second coming, we do still have earthquakes, we still have wars, we still have pandemics, but it does not mean God has forgotten us, far from it. He urges us to turn to him and trust him. Verse 27, Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert, my way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is ignored by my God? God knows this is a tough time. God knows his people are suffering. And it's not as if God's missing what's going on. It's not as if God is unaware. It's not as if God disregards what's happening to his people. He cares. He cares. Verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There's no limit to his understanding. Do you really think the creator God who sits above the circle of the earth missed what's going on? That he missed that Judah was carted off into the Babylonian captivity? That he missed that a virus made its way into the first human contact and began a spread. No. God does not grow weary. He does not take naps. He does not take a coffee break and bad things happen on his watch. He is a sympathetic high priest who knows what it's like to suffer. And Isaiah says, not only does he know and care, he's done something. Verse 29, he gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. We've all been there, and some today might be feeling that, powerless, wondering what the future holds. God gives strength, verses 30 and 31. Youths may become faint and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. Even the young and strong have times where it just seems too much. And then we turn to the Lord, and He renews our strength. Verse 31, they will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. God cares and he has a plan. He says, turn to me and I will strengthen you and make you soar. And our hope is that ultimately sin and its consequences are dealt with. Notice the plan doesn't mean that you don't go through the trial of weakness and fainting. It doesn't mean as soon as there is a pandemic, God wipes it out. Ultimately, he will. 
But for now, we trust that God is powerful and He cares and He has a plan. What is our strength for today? Frederick Nietzsche, the famous atheist philosopher, once said this, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. If you know why something's happening, you can bear it. No, didn't work in Nietzsche's life. He was profoundly unhappy. He had a complete breakdown and remained incapacitated. His philosophy failed him miserably. Isaiah gives us a different hope. He says, he who has a who to live for can bear almost any why. Knowing there's an ultimate cure, knowing there is one who cares, knowing there's one who has done something, that's what will preserve us. He cares so much that he has dealt with sin. God has reached down, entered into our lives, into this world to do something. Isaiah climaxes with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. See, the exiles were saying, why are bad things happening? We're good. We're your people. Why do bad things happen to good people? They weren't good. No one's good. Psalm 14 says there is no one good, not even one. The real question is, why do bad things happen to bad people? It doesn't have quite the same ring to it, but that's what Scripture says. We're bad and bad things happen. We're bad and sin entered this world. Ultimately, COVID-19 is not here because of an animal market in Wuhan or because it escaped from a lab somewhere. It's here because Adam fell. And God says, I've got a plan for that. And I'm going to deal with sin and every consequence forever. What is that plan? That a bad thing will happen to the only good person. Isaiah 53, 4-6, He himself bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. He was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment for our peace and we're healed by his wounds. God may or may not heal those physically who get coronavirus, but he will absolutely heal eternally those who trust in him. Illness, old age, death are finally defeated. The sting of death will be gone. It will be defanged. It will be destroyed in him. So brothers and sisters, I know this is a time of fear and uncertainty and questions. Here is the antidote to fear, a real certainty. And the answer is that our God is is greater. He is greater than any pandemic. He is greater than any disaster. Whatever happens in the days ahead, he says, I will be with you. No matter what you go through, I will be with you and he will hold us fast. I'm going to leave with the wonderful words of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only hope in life and death? That I'm not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. That is our hope. Please pray with me. Our Father, thank you that we do have the answer to the problems besetting our world, and we know that real problem is sin, and we know the answer is Christ, who is our only hope in life and in death. I know many are fearful, May we turn our hearts and our eyes to you. May we trust you to hold us fast through life's fearful path. May your perfect love drive out our fear. Help us to trust that you will walk with us every step of the way through this trial. We know that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. At this time, may we be your hands and your feet to serve one another, and may we be salt and light to the world. Father, be with all the flock at this time. And I ask this in the precious name of Christ, our Saviour. Amen. I want to finish with a very appropriate song. I'm going to ask Murray to come on up. He will hold me fast.
Jesus has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with Him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When He comes at Thanks for worshipping with us. A reminder, join one of our online groups. If you're not part, uh, just email Richard. He will join you up with one of them. Please join us next Sunday at 9.30. And I'm just going to leave you with a benediction from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, Though its water roars and foams and the mountains quake with its turmoil. Amen. Lord bless. See you then. Thank you.